Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today we are talking about a very important topic which is brain tumor. Every year more than 30,000 people get diagnosed with brain tumors in India. And the unfortunate thing is that more than 20% of these are in children. And doctors believe that this number might not even show the true picture. Many people are out there who might not even be getting diagnosed. So I want to learn more about brain tumors and what can we do about them. So I've come to Apollo Hospital in Delhi to speak to one of the leading neurosurgeons in the country, Dr. Gaurav Tyagi. Dr. Tyagi, thank you for joining in and Hello. taking out the time. How are you? I'm good. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So you are a neurosurgeon. You are specialized in um, minimally invasive skull-based surgery. Yeah. And neuro radio surgery. Yes. So, what is that? What is it that you do exactly? So, we uh, treat all kinds of brain tumors and we try to do those with a minimal invasive way so that we create the smallest amount of scar and give uh, like least invasive procedures to the patient. And also, we treat the brain tumors of the skull base, which are diff difficult areas to reach. And uh, of a lot of tumors, we can go and treat through the nose. Mm. And instead of creating a scar on the forehead or cutting the bone, mm. and uh, we go to the nose and treat the tumor, especially like pituitary adenomas, if you know, craniopharyngiomas, those can be treated through the nose. So for the audience to understand, I'm going to show some graphics here yeah. later. But when you say you go through the nose, um, the brain, the level of the brain is sort of above the nose. So if you're going in from here... So, you are reaching the pituitary and the base of the yeah, skull yeah. directly. So we are going to reach the base of the skull through nose. And right. it's almost like the center of the whole brain. If you see that pituitary gland is there. Right. And from there we can reach above in the area. So you are creating very small footprint on the whole. Uh, it's just going through natural orifices. So we try to do that. As opposed to say opening the skull yeah. and going in. Yeah. We do opening the skull as well. Yeah. So for most cases. But we try to be as cosmetically good for that. And also doing... A maximal safe resection that is the concept of any uh, neurosurgical procedure for brain tumors right how big of a problem is brain tumor how many brain tumor cases do you see so like you said uh, brain tumors almost five to ten people per lakh patients uh, per lakh people in india okay. have the problem of brain tumors and in our clinic we see somewhere say around 10 cases every day for brain tumors either admitted in the hospital or in the clinic or on online consult so we get in touch with almost 10 patients with brain tumors every day. Wow. And uh, so we offer them surgery, we offer them radio surgery, which we'll discuss, and we offer them uh, radiation of, after tumor resection. Yeah. Like an emergency, yeah. is it a, it's a big medical problem. The burden of yeah, the, brain tumors. The is... burden of brain tumors on the society, uh, yeah. for the social as well as economic burden of the disease is a lot and it is increasing. It's increasing from a few decades back. You yeah, think it's, it's increasing from the few decades back because there are improvement, of course, in the in, in the field of radiology. So we have better investigation procedures. We have more clinics and more doctors now who can, the patients can reach out to. Right. And so a lot of patients and especially also people are living longer now. Mm -hmm. So with old age, there are a lot of tumors which are, occur in elderly people and those get detected also because of early detection of tumor also is happening. Right. So cancer is scary no matter yeah. where you get it yeah. in the body. What makes brain tumors any different from say a tumor in the liver or in the in the gut? Is there are there special challenges for brain tumors that other cancers don't face? So the problem with brain tumors is that the uh, the surrounding area of the tumor like if you say the, if you have a tumor in, in the intestine, you can remove a segment of intestine and you can re-suture that. Right. But in the brain, every area of the brain has got some specialized function. So you just can't go around and just remove the tumor damaging the surrounding area. So we have to be very, very careful um, how we treat not just the tumor, but the whole brain. Mm -hmm. So we have to take out the tumor piecemeal and not like a single whole thing. Right. And we have to remain within the tumor. We just uh, reduce it, make it smaller, take it out then. And the orifices, the approaches to the, uh, to the brain also has to be taken care of where you are entering because you are always surrounded by some important nerves, some important blood vessels, some important nerve neurons of the brain. So, yeah, so every area it, is important. Uh, I remember there was this case when I was a resident where uh, it was a 45-year-old lady and the only complaint was that she would 
get very irritated with her husband for the last three months. And uh, everybody in the family thought that, oh, it's just that the husband is annoying her. Yeah. But the husband brought the wife saying that, uh, no, she would never get annoyed with me before. It's not my fault. Check her. And we did a scan and there was a frontal lobe tumor. Yeah, so the problem with frontal lobe tumors are uh, they generally present with sometimes behavior and personality changes, mm -hmm. memory disturbances. You may have uh, like the or, or your patient may become suddenly dull, socially recluse. You may have some calculation deficits and all those things are there. So you have some sort of cognitive dysfunction rather than showing up with headache and getting uh, any limb deficit or anything. Right. So that changes in behavior, changes in personality. Sometimes you see there is an underlying brain tumor. Yeah. So that's an interesting presentation. Correct. So people also need to be aware of this that yeah. sometimes brain tumors can present in very yeah. subtle ways and any change in behavior should be looked yeah. at. Something which is out of the, uh, no, like, our. Uh, Okay, something yeah. which is like out of ordinary, the behavior is significantly worse and progressively going in one direction. Right. So I think that has to, you have to see your neurologist or your neurosurgeon. But most brain tumors, they present with some mass effect on the brain and cause mm. headache. Mm. Uh, you may have blurring of vision. Mm. You may have vomiting, nausea with the hemorrhage headache, especially vomiting getting early morning. Mm. And uh, then you may have giddiness with your tumor. And there... Tumors also located in specific areas of the brain, like we're discussing with the frontal lobes. So if there is a tumor which is close to, the, say, your optic nerves, which are the nerves to the eyes, right. you may have decreased vision, you may have altered smell, uh, you may have uh, decreased hearing with tumors of vestibular nerve, or the eighth nerve, as we were discussing, and you may have facial weakness, you may have difficulty swallowing, walking imbalances, or weakness of a limb. Yeah. So those are the symptoms of the, how uh, brain tumors present. But most of them have some sort of headache, yeah. Uh, giddiness, uh, vision impairment. And right. This is an interesting point because in my neurology clinic, uh, a lot of patients come with headache. Yeah. And there is a general fear that what if it's brain tumor? Yeah. And we are told that not every headache needs a scan unless there are red flags. Yeah. So what you are describing are actually all the red flags that come along with headache. Yeah. Um, and I would assume that if anybody has a new onset headache yeah. or headache that they've never had before, then it is a red flag and yeah. they should get uh, imaged. Yeah, so mostly uh, this is called the, when the pressure inside the brain increases. So the headache will be, it will be progressive. It will involve most part of your brain, like it will be holocranial, as we say, right. it will involve your whole brain. Yes. And then it will be not relieving with your simple rest medication or anything. Then you may have blurring of vision with headache, which is very, very important sign. And if you are having giddiness and uh, if you are having vomiting with your headache, so mm -hmm. that is like early morning, you get up, you have nausea and you get vomiting and your vomiting is relieving your headache. Mm -hmm. So those are the signs of raised pressure inside the brain mm -hmm. that something is wrong and you need to see your uh, neurologist, neurosurgeon immediately. Yeah. yeah, that's a very important point. And I'm, I'll make sure that we highlight these yeah. points for public awareness. Yes. I wanted to ask you about treatment of uh, brain tumors and I know that now in India there are more and more places where brain tumor is getting treated at you can say global standards. Um, what has changed in the treatment of brain tumor in the last decade or so? So the treatment of brain tumor starts with first investigation right yeah. so there have been remarkable changes in how we have moved from doing only x-rays and then going to CT scan. Now we have MRI, which has gone to three Tesla, seven Tesla improving. Yeah. And we have a lot of things associated with MRI where we do functional mapping of the brain and we see how the tumor is related to some areas of the brain which are important for function of like a limb yeah. or your speech. Right. So we do MRI for every brain tumor patients and MRI just not only help us to diagnose the lesion, but also help us to plan how to approach it. Right. And uh, after MRI, we plan the surgery either through, uh, the, through the skull, through the brain, or we go through the nose and how to be taken out. How do we go for complete tumor removal or we do partial resection that we plan according to the type of tumor. Right. And uh, so we, we use microscope in most of the cases while doing surgery, except while we are doing through the nose, we use an endoscope, but otherwise we use a microscope. And we see in the microscope and we operate like this. So it's like you're playing uh, with your headset or playing right. a game. 
Right. So a microscope is used for most of the cases and uh, we, we operate on, on your finger level, so yeah. uh, or your wrist. So it's not like you're op opening yeah, your arm and taking out tumors like uh, this. Mm -hmm. And uh, with, with now improvement in, in the concepts of micro neurosurgery with imaging, uh, with microscopes, with endoscopes, we use intraoperative navigation, which are uh, which which help us to know in real time where exactly we are we as compared to the pre-op MRI is and what exactly right. are the lesion which are to be uh, which are to be removed what is to be spared right. and we can use angiographies within while operating intraop with in the micro, real time in to, real to time to see the blood vessels yeah, yeah. to see the blood vessels as well as to see the surround margins of the tumor uh, so those areas right. will take like we use fluorescein we use ALA so these are different dyes which can be used. Yeah. intraoperative for tumor resection very important point so so that people get context it's very important to remove the margins of the tumor because if it is a malignant so tumor it, it can come back yeah we try to do that but it, it's not like uh, oncology principles elsewhere in the body where you need margin because the surrounding areas are very important so yeah, yeah, they may right. have some functional uh, deficit if we go removing too much of surrounding brain tissue right so in those cases we may have to compromise of not removing that but we do maximal safe resection right. that means you go as much as the tumor as possible as much of the tumor which is obviously visible right. and if we use these adjuncts as i said to remove more of the tumor but not giving deficits to the patient so that right. thing has to be balanced with and this is the challenge of neurosurgery yeah. which other organs might not face as yes. much because every centimeter of yeah. brain tissue every matters. Millimeter of brain tissue, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about global versus Indian standards, because uh, there is there might be this belief that uh, the treatment of such complex problems would be better outside. But is that the case? Has India so come up to global standards? If if you see some centers like the one we are sitting now, or the one we and you are trained uh, yes. in in places like Niman, Sanjay Gandhi, PGI, Ames, all yes. these places, these standards are almost as good as in any country in the West. Okay, uh, we have all the equipments. We have doctors who are trained in West in here with lots of experience that are doing well. But there's a big disparity. You know, these are available in all the metro cities and all the good mm. government institutions. But it's not uh, uniform across the country. So that is the one big challenge that we are facing. That's why we are all overloaded with work right. in metros and other places. So that we, it has not percolated down to all the centers. Right. It's becoming better mm -hmm. now with more regional centers coming up. But if you see uh, in areas in, say, in, in Delhi, in Bombay, in Bangalore, we have the treatment. Uh, we have centers of excellence which are as good as anywhere in the West. Right. And, and we are treating patients at a significantly less cost. Uh, right. to the patient yeah that was going to be my next question actually which is what is the cost of something like a brain tumor surgery um, in India because I know that a lot of people would have that as a significant challenge in getting the right care so could you give the audience some kind of understanding about the costs so it's it's variable it depends on where you are getting it done if there are good government centers where you can get it done almost free because there are not a lot of schemes are there uh, from the government which has been given for poor people and uh, if if you come to a hospital for a corporate hospital i say average it can be uh, a brain tumor surgery can be done say between somewhere 3 lakh to 10 lakh rupees yeah and uh, if you compare these to the west like uh, a surgery similar surgery which is done in us will be hundreds of thousand rupees hundred thousand dollars dollars right. yeah so it is uh, significantly cheaper compared right. to any western country in india right. with the same standards and that must mean that there will be people there who have say an insurance problem or who are on a long waiting list yeah i'm sure there must be a lot of people coming from the west yeah to india to get Treatment. So there are people coming from West because of long waiting time, especially like country like UK, you've seen the yes. NHS is such a big problem. Absolutely. And mostly like Indians settle there. They want to come back here and get the surgery done because right. they know they trust the healthcare system here. Right. And the cost is also a benefit for them. Like it's easy. The whole thing coming here, flying into India, visiting Taj Mahal, getting surgery <laughs> done and going back. It's, it's cheaper yeah. uh, than getting it operated in, in private in UK. Yeah. And, uh, but there are patients in uh, in countries where the healthcare is not as good mm. like you may 
like to go in you know, like the erstwhile CIS countries or the or the poorer part of Middle East right. and African countries. So those countries patients have it uh, found have find it easier to come to India right. compared to going to anywhere in Europe or US in amounts of cost or in amount of availability of uh, of specialists. Right. So those are the countries who are coming in numbers to all major cities, and it's uh, India is one of the big healthcare uh, tourism destinations. Amazing. Uh, speaking of newer advances, I know that um, there is a new radiotherapy um, treatment option yeah. that's come up called Zapex. Yes. Uh, can you tell me what Zapex is and why is it so revolutionary? Yeah. So uh, before Zapex, I just want to tell you about radio surgery, right? Sure. So it's uh, so there is radiotherapy and radio surgery. So what we do after any tumor removal, we send the patient sometimes if they need to radio therapy. And therapy is given on small fractions of radiation given over a period of like 28 to 20, 30 days. So you go right. every day, you get your radiation done. Right. What radio surgery does is give very high doses of uh, radiation in mm. a single session. Mm. So it's the timing of a surgery, the precision of a surgery, but the dose is very high. So that dose you give to only the tumor. So there is less damage to the surrounding tissue right. and you give it in like a single session. So those so are not what, in cycles. Yeah, that's why it is called radio surgery. Okay. And the one which is given over a long period is called radiotherapy. So uh, like, for example, for any brain tumor, we give around 60 gray over mm. a period of 30 days. So okay. that's almost around around two gray per two day. Days per cycle. So yeah. in uh, radio surgery, we give 15 gray, 18 gray, 20 gray in a single shot. Oh. And the machine has to be precise so that there is no surrounding damage to the normal areas of the brain. Right. That's why we have dedicated machines for intracranial radio surgery. Right. So Zap is one of the machines, like Gamma Knife is uh, one. Correct. So, so Gamma Knife was the one that came first. Yeah. And uh, that has, uh, I think, Cobalt. Yeah. So uh, Gamma Knife uh, is been there for almost 40 year, 50 years. Right. And uh, the concept was initiated in Sweden, 1950s and 60s. And that machine is considered almost the gold standard for radio surgery and was the only dedicated radio surgery machine for brain. Right. So, uh, but it uses radioactive cobalt, which is a source for handling of it, for making that we have to create a special uh, bunkers where this machine can be kept because uh, of course radioactive isotopes, you right. take extra care for that. And that has to be replaced after every five to seven years because it constantly right. decays. Right. What ZAP does, it uses a LINEX, which is an X-ray generator, and it uses X-ray photon rays right. to give uh, that precise radiation. Okay. So we have the physics of gamma knife, but no cobalt. So, so we the use the effect is the same. Yeah. So okay. physics-wise, it is the effect is as good as gamma knife. There is no uh, the sh very sharp beams, so that surrounding tissue doesn't get the same amount of radiation which we are giving it to the tumor. Interesting. I have a physics question. Which is, if you are, say, I, I imagine it like a laser. Yeah. And so that laser is going into your brain. At what point, how do you control the depth? So, uh, we use a pre-operative MRI and CT. Okay. So, those are fused together and we mark the tumor. Right. And we put it in the machine. So, that machine knows that where exactly the beam has to stop, where the energy has to be transferred. Correct. So, it comes from all angles. So, it goes one shot from here, one shot from here, one shot from here. So, multiple shots all together cumulative dose will be that. Oh. And we also measure the exit dose continuously. How right. much is coming out of the head right. to make sure that everything is in place and right. only that tumor in the center is getting. So, this is called stereotaxy. It is right. knowing in three dimension your localization of your tumor. Right. So the complete word is stereotactic radio surgery, SRS. That is the technique. Yeah. Incredible. Uh, just imagining it, I feel this is uh, so technically advanced. Yeah. Uh, and doing this will reduce the size of the tumor. And even if, say, you want to subject the patient to a actual surgery, this might make that task easier. Yeah. So what? Radio surgery does is alter the DNA of the uh, like radiation induced changes in the DNA of the tumor cells. Right. So they stop replicating and they eventually reduce in size. So body's immune system take over. Right. So the tumor uh, from the day we give radio surgery, 
in most cases stop growing from that moment on and slowly over a period of time it dissolves away and goes down got it so how radio surgery is beneficial it is not for all brain tumors like the most common tumor as we were discussing is glioma yes and it is not radio surgery is not the primary treatment for glioma we have to do surgery first okay. then do radiotherapy if there are recurrences give radio surgery but there are more, almost 50% of tumors in the brain are benign and uh, so there are meningiomas vestibular mm. schwannomas pituitary adenomas mm. so sometimes small incidentally detected tumors mm. which you have had a scan done for say you have a trivial fall or a headache and you did a scan and you saw there is a small tumor small right. i mean less than 3 cm right so you just can avoid going for like complete surgery uh, invasive procedure to remove that it may be in a deeper location in the brain mm. and you avoid damaging the surrounding tissue in a part while undergoing surgery so we can give radio surgery to that it's a day care procedure you come inside oh. get it done like an mri just go inside the machine come out treatment time is around 30 minutes to 1 1 and a half hour wow. and uh, you can just get it uh, done in a day's time that is actually incredible yeah. uh, out of curiosity dnets which is the neuroectodermal tumors yeah. are they amenable for this uh, dnet the primary tumor uh, if mostly they present with epilepsy they cause seizures yes so uh, in in cases of dnet we would like to do uh, if they are not the seizures are not controlled and the lesions are growing surgery is the primary treatment right. but for salvage therapy uh, like for partially resected tumors or right. in those cases radio surgery can be given i think this is just important for people to know um, because then they at least know that there are options available yeah. because i feel that a lot of people once they get a diagnosis of something yeah. like a brain tumor they immediately feel that there's that's it there's And nothing that can be done yeah. so i feel the con this conversation is helpful from yeah. that respect so now that we have spoken about zapex so much i am curious to see the machine yeah. so can we take a yes, look yes sure we Amazing. can do it yeah so that was a very interesting setup yeah. uh what are the cases that are now possible to treat which wasn't possible before so uh there was a uh, there was an interesting case like wasn't brain tumor but uh, it was an avm inside the brain stem in the medulla you know so avm is it uh, arteriovenous yes. malformation arteriovenous malformation so it's a small malformation of blood vessels in the brain right and uh, it can rupture and cause bleeding okay and it was in a brain stem a very treacherous location very right. close to all your areas of where every the control of your heart and your breathing and everything in medulla right and it was very small it was just 1.5 cm but it caused a rupture inside the brain stem and that lady survived that she was a young girl mm -hmm. and uh, she came to us after 2 months after the rupture and uh, so that it doesn't rupture again we plan to do radio surgery for it Right. and treating that surgically or by endovascular treatment like going through the blood vessels and blocking it right. wasn't possible because of the location and surrounding uh, important blood vessels so we did uh, radio surgery to that and also it was a challenging case because we cannot give more dose uh, to that area because in brain stem all the neurons are very tightly packed in right. a very small area correct so even if you were to give it at a larger area you will damage yeah, important centers around so the radiation may cause uh, damage to the surrounding tissue right. so every area is important so that 
a very thin strip of AVM had to be planned and then we run a lot of stimulations and we made sure that we are very, very precise and with this machine, right. with the precision and uh, the versatility, we were able to do that case. Right. So that was an interesting case. Yeah. So this is this is interesting because it opens up so many new avenues of yes. placement, yeah. which earlier it wasn't. Yes. Um, again, now I'm curious, can this be ever used for epilepsy surgeries? So yes, uh, so that there is a big subset of functional and psycho uh, surgery cases which can be done using radio surgery. Okay. So I, before coming to epilepsy, I'll tell you first is trigeminal neuralgia, you know, the pain right. on the face. Yes. So there are some cases which are not fit for surgery who have exhausted all the other options of right. treatment. Right. Those are good candidates that can be done by radio surgery. We, and okay. uh, then that is very interesting yes. because I have, I have a gripe against trigeminal neuralgia in that uh, so just for people to understand, trigeminal nerve is a nerve running on the face and some people will have very sharp shooting pains on yeah. their face. And invariably, all my trigeminal neuralgia patients would have at some point gone to a dentist. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> they would have had one or two teeth removed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, despite removing the teeth, if they haven't had pain relief, then they come to, then they come to the neurologist. Yes. So I'm yet to see a trigeminal neuralgia patient with all their teeth yeah. intact. So um, for trigeminal neuralgia, if they come to us, first treatment is first medical, you know, that right. we give medicines to them. So there are, uh, then if the patient is still symptomatic and we see a, a blood vessel coming close to the nerve, yeah. we opt, uh, we uh, explain the patient and give the option of surgery because that has the maximum, uh, you know, imp uh, chances of improvement. Over a period of five to ten years, it has right. the best results. Right. But then there are some cases who are not fit for surgery, right. elderly patient, or who have undergone surgery and failed. Right. Those are a good subset of patients we can do it by using ZAP. Right. And apart from trigeminal neuralgia, ZAP can be used to treat uh, uh, radio surgery. Can be used to treat uh, tremors. So we can make lesions in your basal ganglia, right. uh, and we can use treatment for tremors, unilateral tremors. Uh, early one-sided uh, predominant Parkinson's disease. Right. Then we can do treatment for OCD, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder. This is fascinating yeah. because I don't think I've ever uh, seen an OCD patient getting so, surgical yes. treatment. Yeah. So is this a new development? No, we were doing in Nimans, we were doing a project on uh, OCD where we were doing DBS for uh, yes. OCD. So we had done quite a lot of cases there and and uh, they were improving actually. and and. Uh, so radio surgery can also be done to create a permanent lesion in, in the areas. Okay. So to treat this. And apart from OCD, it has done for chronic pain syndromes. For it can also be used for like we were discussing, it can be used for creating lesions in epilepsy. Right. But uh, it is not as widespread use of radio surgery as yet. Right. But there are a lot of papers which have shown improvements in it. But I have no experience on treating epilepsy with it. But it's a possibility we can do it. Yeah, but this is very interesting because it seems like it is opening up a whole new world yes, of possibilities. Yes. And um, as research goes, we yeah. learn more and more about yeah. where we can use this. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about patients who have already undergone surgery. So they've gone through surgery, they've gone through uh, radiotherapy. What is What does rehabilitation look like for a brain tumor patient? So... Uh, generally for brain tumor patients, our rehabilitation, if everything goes well, the patient goes walking home. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big stress for the patient, for the whole family that you have undergone a tumor patient, especially for tumors which require therapy, radiation therapy after yeah. that. Right. And uh, in, in that time, they need a lot of uh, help from our neuropsychologists because it's, it's draining for them. Yeah. And also because of the location of tumor, there can be sometimes transient to permanent changes in behavior, in personality, right. in language areas. Sometimes the tumor which was close to your left side of your brain was right. close to language centers. If you have some speech disorder, you need a speech therapist. Yeah. We need physiotherapy and rehab people to take care. If you have developed some transient or permanent deficits with your locomotor function. Right. So yeah, those. So we need a supportive staff which uh, around a neurosurgeon. Right. Of, uh, for cases of brain tumors once we do that. Right. And apart from that, we need uh, counseling for the family and for the patient, right. counseling about how the prognosis of the tumor is going to be, 
how they're going to take the stress and how the, they're going to go around the whole therapy because it's very taxing to undergo radiation therapy and then sometimes chemotherapy is required. And that is especially true for kids, you know, when children mm -hmm. having tumor, the whole family gets uh, impacted by that. Absolutely. And this is such an important point that you highlighted because the mental health aspect yeah. of cancer is um, largely overlooked because yes. all the focus is on chemo, radio. Yeah. But uh, the family, the patient themselves yeah. and the family is going through so much. Yeah. Um, in fact, one of my colleagues was working in um, a children's hospital in Bombay. And um, they, were, they did a project where the kids who are coming with cancer, what is the impact of that on the siblings? Yeah. And it's, it's a... this is something that most people don't think about, but that sibling is so conflicted hmm. because the parents' entire attention is on the sick kid. Yeah. And the sibling will feel that they, they're feeling sad for the patient. At the same time, they they're feel that nobody's out. looking at yeah. me. It is Too so much stress for such a young age. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. So counseling is so important in yes. such a situation. So yeah, a lot of um, hospitals and centers, especially which are dealing with cancer and, and neurological as well as psychiatric diseases, we have a, a social worker team which right. takes care of all this thing, which, you know, the clinician may not be able to give that much time on these aspects all the, uh, always because you are, uh, you are more focusing on how to improve the clinical outcomes mm -hmm. or the surgical outcomes. And we have a supportive staff which takes care of these things. Yeah. One question that is very, very important is... Can there be anything that people can do to prevent brain tumors? So, uh, this is an interesting question actually, but uh, uh, there are some genetic syndromes where if you, uh, their brain, like neurofibromatosis, yeah. like Turcot's, MEN, uh, yeah. these are syndromes where you have tumors in other part of the body as well. So, if those syndromes are running in your family, you can have screenings for early detection. But right. I'm not sure that there are any things which we can do to prevent brain tumors. But okay. uh, indirectly, how we can affect this is by causing the overall tumor load, you know, the metastasis to the brain from other tumors ah. is, an, uh, is a, a big subset of tumors that we see in daily practice. Right. So if suppose the commonest tumor in the world, lung cancer reduces, so there can be less mets in the brain. Right. So if so you can reduce smoking, not get lung cancer. Yeah. The lifestyle changes can avoid breast cancer yeah. or alcohol, like for getting any GI cancers and all those things. So right. uh, you can reduce metastasis to the brain. So just indirectly, your lifestyle may affect that. Yes. But for primary brain tumors, uh, I'm not sure how you can prevent it. There is nothing as such yet. But uh, uh, history of prior radiation, hmm. uh, getting uh, radiation before in your lifetime to the brain is a potential uh, risk factor. You know, risk factor. Got it. So if you've had radiation in your childhood, you can be a little more careful to get some time screening in, but uh, yeah. it doesn't work that way. But it's a very, very interesting point yeah. because while primary brain tumor, yes. you may not be able to prevent um, except for screening yeah. and early detection, a very important point that you can still Take care of your secondary tumors. Yeah. So metastasis ko tum kam kar sakte. Yeah. You can, right. yeah, you can avoid them reaching brain. Yes. So, yeah. And uh, yeah, when it comes to brain tumors, I think we should take all the odds that we can get <laughs> and uh, definitely reduce cancers elsewhere in your body yeah. so that you can avoid metastasis to the brain. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good point. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaurav. Now, I want to change the direction of this conversation to truth finding. Yeah. So, there are a lot of myths out there about brain tumors, misunderstandings that people have. So, let's take you through some of these myths okay. and you can break them or you can say that, yes, this is true. Okay. So, in one or two lines. So, this will be more of a quick question yeah. and answer. Okay. So, the first myth that people have is brain tumor means brain cancer. So is there a difference between the two? So, yes, tumor can be benign and malignant. Mm -hmm. So, more than 50%, almost 50% of the brain tumors are benign. So, if treated with surgery and uh, uh, we can have a good uh, lifestyle, which is as good as having a normal lifestyle. So, if we do not get deficits after removing that brain tumor, or we give radio surgery for those benign tumors. I think the patient can be as good as a normal person. As a normal person. There are, but the commonest brain tumor is glioma, mm -hmm. and it has four stages. And I think uh, stage three and four are very malignant. Right. And uh, those required 
extra therapy, radiation therapy or chemotherapy after surgery. Right. But most brain tumors are benign. Mm. But it's because they are located in very critical areas and surrounding brain tissue is important. That's why the treatment is a little complicated. But right. otherwise, as such, the tumor biology, they are benign. Uh, just so that people understand, a benign tumor is one that doesn't yeah. spread. A benign tumor is one which does not spread to other areas apart right. from its location. Right. But locally, it can have a recurrence at the same area right. if it is not removed completely. And it can increase in, increase size, in size in that place. Yeah. It can right. increase in size and cause mass effect on the normal brain. Correct. But the malignant tumors, they have more chances of coming back and coming back at different locations from right. the evolved areas. And can malignant tumors also spread outside the brain and go to other parts of the uh, body? The malignant tumors, see brain does not have lymphatics. So one, uh, uh, the exit of tumors from the brain is not there how it, it is from other part of the body. But still there are case reports of these tumors spreading outside of the brain. Or right. even some benign tumors, then they can... Uh, erode through the bone and come out right. outside of the skull right. so that can happen but it does not like uh, usually go to other places in the body understood okay uh, there's myth number two which is that all brain tumors exhibit the same signs and symptoms in all the patients so as we discussed like every part of the brain has its own special function so the tumor in some certain areas may present like in frontal lobe may come with cognitive disturbances, behavior, memory disturbances. If that is in temporal lobe, it can present with seizures or it can have uh, working memory deficits. And uh, if it is in occipital lobe, where you can have visual dysfunction. If it is in the brainstem, you may have cranial nerve function like we discussed. You have hearing, vision, or you have swallowing, speech. All those areas can be affected. But commonly, brain tumors present with headache and vomiting, but then most depending on the location of the tumor, they may have a varied presentation. Right. So very similar to stroke patients where yes. where yeah. the stroke is happening yeah. will decide the symptoms. Yeah. So we can localize the tumor depending on patient symptoms. On the symptoms. So it comes in the clinic and may present it with some, uh, suppose, weakness of one half of the body right. and some history of seizure. So we can know that it's in close so, to the motor strip. Here. Right. Very important point. Uh, so, myth number three is only adults can get brain tumors. No, uh, pediatric brain tumors are one of the most common cancers in children. Mm. I think after blood cancer, they are the second most common uh, oh, wow. tumors and the most common solid tumors of the brain, of the of children. Okay. So, they have sp their own common tumors which are medulloblastoma, ependymoma and germ cell tumors in children. Right. They are very, very common and I think uh, almost one-fifth to one-fourth of all the tumor patients are uh, pediatric patients and it's a big burden on the society, pediatric brain tumors. So, in a child, in a growing child, your brain is anyway hyper, super active, there are more uh, synaptogenesis happening yeah. and all of those things happening. So, is that one of the reasons why children have more it's, brain tumors? Uh, it's, they not have more brain tumors as compared to adults, but if you compare the right. overall the tumors that the children have, right. the brain tumors are comparatively more as compared to other parts of the body. Say for adults, uh, you have more chances of getting a lung cancer or a breast cancer or a prostate cancer, but in children, brain tumors are pretty common compared to other parts of the body. Understood. Uh, a very common myth, which is not just for brain tumors, but overall for tumors or cancer is that using mobile phones, can increase the chance of cancer. Is there any truth to this? So, uh, it's constantly been uh, studied a lot now for the last 20 years or yeah. so about the mobile exposure and cancers. And till now, there is no direct evidence that more using mobile increases your chances of getting brain cancer. Okay. But uh, it causes a lot of other problems, you know. It causes, if you are all the time glued to the mobile, you may have some other problems otherwise, yeah. but not brain cancers. That's as an important yet. point. As but, yet. Yeah, we may know later <laughs> It's after some years. Fair enough. But, but um, yeah, what your point is, mobile phones can still cause lifestyle problems. Yes. And that in turn can lead to yeah. other issues. Yeah. Yeah. That's an important point. But just on this point of radiation, how much radiation is too much radiation? Because people are also worried about radiation from... Uh, not just natural radiation, but radiation from CT scan, from X-rays, even I, I was reading a Reddit article about radiation from microwaves. 
so these are all things that people are worried about oh, no. so i think the people who are exposed to radiation on daily basis uh, for occupational purposes especially some some field doctors who are doing angiography in okay. in uh, in dsa cardiologists who are increased risk of getting radiation okay. induced problems um re- our uh, radiation therapists radiographers x-ray technicians yeah, x-ray technicians right uh, those are the people who get constantly exposed to radiation or if you have had a radiation therapy for some other treatment right. so those are the things which where you increase your chances of getting cancer but suppose you are doing a you know transatlantic flight uh, it's it's not causing that much radiation to you right. your uh, if you get some diagnostic test it is not that significant and uh, yeah other forms of radiation to normal people in the background radiation is not as much as uh, causing any cancer to you understood i think that's a big relief uh, there is a myth or there is an uh, feeling in the public that if you have frequent headaches then you probably have a brain tumor yeah. like i said a lot of patients will come saying that mujhe tumor hua hai aisa lag raha hai so while we do reassure them uh, isn't that also partly true that they yeah, technically they could yes. have so yeah as you are a neurologist you may know headache is like multifactorial you know yeah. your migraines cluster headache so many things are there so uh, but the uh, the headache which is related with tumor as i told you uh, we have some red flag signs yeah so it is progressive including most of your brain whole brain yeah it is giving you early morning headache with nausea with vomiting yeah. you have blurring of vision or giddiness or you get some sort of neuro deficit which is involving some so you know weakness of some area or your some cranial nerve disorders those cases you have to immediately undergo uh, a ct scan or an mri as a uh, to make sure that something is not wrong in your brain understood and the other red flag sign is your treat uh, your headache is not improving with your treatment or there is right. a new onset headache which has got a significantly or your headache has got new characteristic where it was mild before and now it has become severe right. i think that is the time when you should take a scan for the patient also one more thing i would add is if you've never had a headache before and it's you are of an older age group say after 50 or 60 yeah. and you've never had migraine before yeah. a new onset headache yes, in an yeah. older person yeah. should definitely be looked into yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, okay the final myth which is that once you are treated and the doctor says okay you're cured brain tumor will not come back so yes as we were discussing gliomas those uh, are the one of the commonest tumors they are likely to come back if they are high grade mm-hmm. you know you have to so we put the patient on follow up scans we right. make sure that they they do scan after say 6 months or a one year time right and uh, even other tumors benign tumors if we have some small residue left behind those cases are likely to recur again yeah. so you have to be constantly in touch with your uh, uh, with your consultant of of neurosurgeon or primary treating physician and uh, if if there are some benign residual tumors which are critically located close to some important areas of the brain right. we can always do radio surgery for those lesions mm. or uh, other malignant tumors we can give radiotherapy for them so you have to be on a constant follow up so that you does not come up with a sudden surprise yeah absolutely this is a this is something that you have to be vigilant yes. about and you have to uh, convey to the patient that you need to be on regular follow up absolutely i think that about completes our yeah. entire understanding of brain tumors i hope that everyone watching this would have gotten a much better idea yes. both about what brain tumors are what are the main features that patients can come with what are the red flags they should remember and if they are diagnosed with brain tumor unfortunately then there are treatment options available yes. more than ever before so there is a ray of hope even in such a situation yeah dr gaurav thank you so much for joining um, in um, it was a pleasure being here yes. thank you so much absolutely so, today is also world brain tumor day june yes. 8 and it's a good time that we had this conversation yes absolutely let's spread awareness about this uh, topic to more and more people and uh, i'll see you guys in the next video take care